give you just a little helpful insight when it comes to Bible interpretation. It may seem as though we are skipping over chapter 15 of Exodus. Last week when we were together, we looked at Israel getting out at the actual Exodus event in Exodus chapters 13 and 14. What you have in chapter 15 is a song here. In fact, it's titled Israel's Song. It's, how it's, under, it's, it's, it's the song that Israel sings as a celebration of what God has done in the Exodus. Here's a helpful insight. When you're reading long passages, long narrative passages, and the same is true of long apocalyptic passages like the book of Revelation, and you're wondering whether your interpretation of the passage is within the bounds of acceptability, if you'll find the songs or the poems that are situated within that narrative, it, it, it sets the boundaries for you. So it may seem like we're skipping over chapter 15, but in reality, we have already covered chapter 15, or we will be covering chapter 15 in the narrative sections that surround it. Now, when most people go astray in interpreting the Bible, it's in narrative passages and especially in apocalyptic passages. So if you're looking for a text that can sort of set the boundaries for interpretation, look for the songs or the poems that are set within those passages, and they'll, they'll help you. If you come up with something that can't be verified in that song or in that poem, then you'll know you're outside the bounds of what's acceptable interpretation of that passage. Just a handy little resource in interpreting the Bible. Last week, last week when we were together, we talked about getting out. Uh, we sort of personalized the message of the Exodus uh, and talked in terms of getting out of some former circumstance or maybe even a, a present circumstance. Uh, for, for many of us, we reflected on the Exodus event in Israel's history uh, as a reminder of our own getting out. We were dead in sins and trespasses, but God called us out and made us alive in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And we talked about the way God provided for the people of Israel as they made their way out. They came out of their Egyptian bondage with the provision of God. God was with them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, providing shade and the ability to travel in the heat of the day during the day and, and fire so that, so that they could travel. In, 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 the, in the darkness of night, in the cool of the night, they could move their uh, military around the wilderness for the next 40 years. And he provided in a number of ways, even at their initial exit from the nation of, of Egypt. But here, his provision is even clearer. What I'd like us to look at this morning is chapter 16 through chapter 17 and verse number 7. The imagery of these two chapters will be familiar to you. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to be familiar with the concept of manna from heaven. Even the terminology of manna is still used in our culture. It may be separated from the biblical idea and what God was providing. It may even be separated from the idea of God altogether. But, but here, God provides for the needs of Israel by giving bread from heaven and water from a most unlikely place, from a rock in a place of desolation. God proves himself to be faithful in providing for the needs of his people. If you found your way in your copy of God's Word to Exodus 16 and verse number 1, I'd like to invite you to stand out of respect and honor for the reading of God's Word. Exodus chapter 16, beginning in verse number 1, here's what the Bible says. The entire Israelite community departed from Elam and came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the fifteenth day of the second month after they had left the land of Egypt, the entire Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt, when we sat by pots of meat and ate all the bread we wanted. Instead, you brought us into this wilderness to make this whole assembly die of hunger. And the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you. The people are going to go out each day and gather enough for that day. This way I will test them to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people, This evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. In the morning you will see the Lord's glory because he has heard your complaints about him. For who are we that you complain about us? 
Moses continued, the Lord will give you meat to eat this evening and more than enough bread in the morning. For he has heard the complaints that you're raising against him. Who are, you, who are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. Moses told Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord, for he has heard your complaints. And in verse 10, the Bible says, as Aaron was speaking to the entire Israelite community, they turned toward the wilderness, and there in a cloud, the Lord's glory appeared. The Lord spoke to Moses, I have heard the complaints of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will eat bread until you're full, and you will know that I am Yahweh your God. So at evening quail came and covered the camp. In the morning there was a layer of dew all around the camp. And when the layer of dew evaporated, there were fine flakes on the desert surface, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they asked one another, what is it? Because they didn't know what it was. And Moses told them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as each person needs to eat. You may take two quarts per individual according to the number of people each of you has in his tent. And so the Israelites did this. Some gathered a lot, some a little. When they measured it by quarts, the person who gathered a lot had no surplus, and the person who gathered a little had no shortage. Each gathered as much as he needed to eat. Now turn over to chapter 17 and verse number 1. Verse 1 says, The entire Israelite community left the wilderness of sin, moving from one place to the next according to the Lord's command. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So the people complained to Moses, Give us water to drink. Why are you complaining to me? Moses replied to them. Why are you testing the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water and grumbled against Moses. They said, why do you ever bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with us? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what should I do with these people? In a little while, they'll stone me. And the Lord answered Moses, go on ahead with the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take the staff you struck the Nile with in your hand and go. And I'm going to stand there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. When you hit the rock, water will come out of it and the people will drink. Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel, named the place Massah and Meribah, because the Israelites complained and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? May the Lord bless the reading and the preaching of his word. You may be seated. Chapter 16 and verse 1 sort of sets the stage for our understanding of chapters 16 and 17. Verse 1 says, the entire Israelite community departed from Elam and came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had left the land of Egypt. They've left the wilderness of Shur, and now they're traveling to the south and the east into the wilderness of Sin, and they are one month into their wilderness wanderings. That's the setting established by verse number 1. Now, here's something that I don't think I'd ever given any thought to prior to this week. If you're familiar with your Middle Eastern geography at all, you know that Egypt is set in northeast Africa. Israel is in Israel, where it always has been and where it always will be. And so in order to get to Israel from northeast Africa, you need to travel to the north and somewhat to the east. Here, God is leading the children of Israel, having just crossed the Red Sea, in this marvelous miracle, supposedly headed to a land that flows with milk and honey in modern-day Israel. And they are traveling, not only not to the north and the east, they are actually traveling to the south. In some ways, they are going in the opposite direction they might have expected God to lead them. And then God leads them out to this place at such a distance that they run short on supplies. God has led them in what we might assume to be the wrong direction for so long that they run out of the food that would have supplied for their meals for their wilderness journey. 
When we get to chapter 17, the Bible says they come to the place called Rephidim. In the end, it's named Horeb, which means desolation. And it's a rocky place, a desert place, a place of desolation. And there, God has led them nearer Mount Sinai, which we understand from our perspective to be a desired destination. But from their perspective, deeper in the opposite direction. God is leading the children of Israel, that's no question. Their GPS is not broken, they've not taken a wrong turn. Moses is not the stereotypical male afraid to stop and ask for directions. God is leading them. How did they know what direction to go? Remember, there's a pillar of cloud by day and there's a pillar of fire by night that sets the direction for their wilderness travel. God seems to be leading them in the wrong direction. And he's leading them deeper and deeper and deeper into a place of great need. Often that's the way God works in our life. God leads us to places of need. I find myself coming back to this. I was thinking about this this morning, driving over to church. I, I wonder if there's not, I'm not becoming repetitious. Because I find myself revisiting this issue, not just in the context of preaching here, but, but everywhere. Revisiting the idea of God being the Lord even over the difficulties and the hardships that we experience in the here and now. I think that's an incredibly relevant concept that, that we need to know and hold closely in our hearts. That when bad things happen in our life, it's not an indication that God has bailed on us. When we seem to be headed in the opposite direction of the destination we had hoped for, it may be that God is taking you right to the place he would have you to be. God often leads us to a place of, of need. And in reality, where would we be but for the places of need in our life? That's where God grows us. That's where God tests us. That's where God matures us. Each Israel has just come out of their Egyptian bondage. They just got out. And already God is putting their newly formed faith to the test. Isn't it just like God to do just that? Now he's meeting out, he's measuring out the test as we observed last week in ways that are manageable according to his will and the experience of the Israelites. He didn't lead them to war with the Philistines, but he did lead them to war with the Egyptians. But there can be no mistaking the reality that God is leading them in a direction of, of great need. Brothers and sisters, the reality for us is that the space between our getting out and the promised land is filled with great difficulty. If you came into the Christian experience with the expectation that from this moment until you breathe your last, all would be smooth sailing for you, you've come in with some very poor impressions of what it means to follow after Jesus. Jesus said, come to me, the weary, in need of rest, and, and take my easy yoke upon you. But he said, nothing of an easy path that would be traveled. In fact, he said, there's a broad and easy way, but it leads to destruction. The straight and narrow gate filled with trials and difficulties is the way that leads to life. When Paul sought to encourage the church, he didn't say everything's going to be smooth. He said, through many trials and much struggle must you enter the kingdom of God. And it's through those trials, those trials, those struggles, the difficulties we experience along the way that our faith is tested, that we are matured, that God grows us in grace, that we be who he'd have for us to be. I, th I think this issue is important for the church so that we know what to do when the doctor says it's the big C. So that we know what to do when there's an unexpected and tragic accident in our family that takes the people we love the most. So we know what to do when the, when the boss says, we, we think your time here is over. So, so that we know how to bear with even the everyday struggles that when compounded can seem as big as any of those issues mentioned just moments ago. When the family's disrupted, when there's a brokenness in our heart, when we're in the pit of despair, what are we going to do? How, how does our vision of who God is and how he's at work in our life comfort and encourage us 
And the encouragement of the scripture is that he is Lord even in the place of need. That the sufferings of the present age are not worthy to be compared with the glory that awaits us in Christ Jesus. And so often it is the case, in fact, universally it is the case, that God brings us to the place of need so that he might prove his faithfulness in providing for us in ways that are completely unexpected. Are you all with me this morning? This is important. If it's not for you today, it will be soon. When the sky falls around your head and you wonder where you'll turn. I think this is relevant even for the world. The statisticians and researchers say that, that, that one of the most pre- prevalent claims or charges against Christianity, against even the existence of God, is this wrestling with the problem of evil. Why do, do bad things happen to good people? And, 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 the, and the, the scripture helps us in a way to answer that, although foundationally, fundamentally, doesn't address that issue directly, like the origin of evil. It does address the issue of of why evil things happen, why bad things happen in the experience of, of good people. You know why bad things happen in your life? Because of God's grace. Because we are so stubborn, so bullheaded in our humanity that apart from the place of need, very little is going to happen in the way of spiritual growth and maturity. I I dare say there's not a soul in this room who came to faith in Jesus that was not in a season of need in their life. Isn't that where God leads us out in the wilderness, out in a place of thirst, out in a place of hunger, out in the opposite direction of where we hope to go with our life? And there, under those circumstances, brought to our knees, God reveals himself gloriously through his son, Jesus Christ. I'll add to a previous comment that the Bible doesn't address the origin of evil because the Bible is disinterested in, in so much of the origin of evil. Rather than theorizing about where evil comes from, the Bible chooses to just do something about it. And what God does about the problem of evil is to send his son into the world that he would absorb the sting of death that he would overcome the previously unconquerable grave, that he would be the resurrection and the life, that he would put all manner of evil under his feet, cast into the lake of fire forever. You need to know that God is God, even out in the wilderness, in that place of deep and desperate need. Often God leads us to the place of need. I want you to note, secondly, that it's in the place of need that our faith is tested. Now note what the Israelites do when they get out there. When in chapter 16, out headed from Elam towards Sinai, a month into their wilderness wandering, they say, Moses, you should have just left us back in Egypt. We had all the meat we wanted when we lived in Egypt. Now I don't know if that's true or not, but I doubt it is. Have you noticed that we remember things far better than they were in reality? I've had the privilege of pastoring a a number of uh, members of the Great Depression generation through the years. And they always speak of that season in America's history as being this wonderful time in their childhood life. And I'm thinking, brother, I read the book. It wasn't all that great. Or you get with some of your friends, especially at my my age, and you start talking about the high school days. We're always better in our stories about high school than we were in reality. Have y'all noticed that? The bench warmer is the starting quarterback. You know know what I mean. it's It's always better in our memory than it was in reality. And here the Israelites said, yeah, I bet. The Israelites said, you should have just left us back there. It was better for us. Have you ever heard someone share their testimony and it sounded like more fun on the other side than it had been since they crossed over in Jesus? We're just wired that way. You should have just left us back there. There there may be one or two or three or 90 of you who are toying with the idea of going back to your Egyptian ways. 
returning to the bondage that God has freed you from. And I just want to remind you this morning that it ain't all it's cracked up to be over there. You may be remembering the high points, but what you've forgotten about are the endless trials, struggles, and difficulties that come along with life on the other side. There may have been meat for the Israelites, but there was also chains and slavery. It's not what you remember it having been. There they said, Moses, you should have left us back there. Already their, their confidence in God's provision is broken. Just out on the horizon is a cloud where the glory of God dwells. And they say, Moses, we'd have been better off in Egypt. How quickly we forget. God shows up and, and provides. But even in the provision, even in the provision, there is a test of faith. You go out and, and you gather enough for that day. That's simple enough. We read of how God provided manna from heaven. You know what manna means? It means what's this? If we really wanted to translate the terminology for manna, we'd call it, what's this bread? What's this? It just comes down from heaven. What is this bread? And they gather enough for the day, and it would last the day, but there were some greedy people in Israel, and they gathered more than they really needed for that day. And you know what they found when they woke up on the next day? It bred maggots, and it was destroyed. And there were some people who didn't gather quite enough. Maybe they had underestimated the need of their family. And you know what they found? That it was, it was good to fill every belly in their home. It was all they ever needed. And then God said, on the sixth day, here's what I want you to do. I want you to gather enough for two days. And now, miraculously, what has been provided uh, for one day is going to be enough for two days. And it's not going to breed maggots the way it did when you tried to get greedy on Wednesday. And they go out and they gather enough for two days. And sure enough, it lasts. Even in the way God provides, there is a test. You ever prayed and just said, Lord, I wish you'd provide for this need in this way so I could just stop thinking about this and set this aside and move on to the next thing. And, and, he, and, he, and he never provides in that way, does he? There, there's always a continued uh, prayer interest in that particular matter as we wrestle through that uh, season of our life. We learn to trust the Lord in the testing our, of our faith through the hardship that God provides. I want you to think about that language. Through the hardship that God provides. The hardship that God provides tests and strengthens our faith in Him. If you'll begin to think about your hardships as hardships that God provides, it will revolutionize your perspective on the difficulties that you're facing. God leads us to the place of need. In the place of need, our faith is, is tested. Thirdly, I want you to see that in the place of need, our God is faithful. He gives them bread from heaven. Go over to chapter 17 and let's look at the example of water from a rock. It's a fascinating thing that God does here. Chapter 17 and verse number 5, the Lord answered Moses as he brought to God the complaints of the Israelite, their expression of need. And he said, go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take the staff you struck the Nile with in your hand and go. And I'm going to stand here in front of you on the rock at Horeb. And when you hit the rock, water will come out of it and the people will drink. Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. He named the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites complained and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Here they are in the desert, in a desolate place. That's what Horeb means, a rocky place. And God says, go over to the most unlikely place to ever get water. And take the staff that you stretched over the Nile. And strike the rock. And when you strike a rock, water is going to come out. Under the most unlikely of circumstances, when conditions were the exact opposite of what you might hope they'd be, that God could provide through some natural means, God provides in the most unlikely of ways. Yes, God provided for the needs of Israel, but remember, 
God brought them to this place of need in the first place. God brought about, he ordained for the people both the need and the provision are a part of God's plan for Israel. The need and the way God provides are a part of God's plan for Israel. And in all likelihood, in your personal experience, the need that you will experience and the way God provides in the most unlikely of ways are a part of God's plan for your life too. If, if we ever get to a place where we can embrace the season of need with as much enthusiasm as we embrace the provision of God, we'll have gone a long way toward being made over in the image and likeness of his son, Jesus Christ. Now, in the last few minutes here, what I want to show you is the way the New Testament takes up this text. Because the New Testament treatment of this passage protects us against coming to bad conclusions. Because here's what, here's what we want, and I'll prove it to you in just a moment. What we want is to be able to say about and over our lives, God is going to provide for every need. And we want to be able to interpret that sometimes exclusively in the context of physical or financial needs. That appeals. There is a reason the health and prosperity gospel advances in the world today. Because I don't know if y'all notice this or not, but people like health and prosperity. Matter of fact, Brother Wade is not against health and prosperity. Let the record show. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is not about health and prosperity. In fact, the call of the gospel is to forsake health and prosperity that Jesus would be famous in the world around us. Take up the cross, Jesus said, and follow after me. Now, turn in your Bibles, if you would, for just a moment to one of my favorite chapters in the Scripture, John chapter number 6. In John chapter 6, Jesus has just shared a meal with more than 5,000 men on the plains. In fact, the feeding of the 5,000 is such an important miracle in Jesus' ministry. It is the only miracle recorded in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Jesus providing for the needs, the physical needs, the food need of the people, it sparks a conversation between himself and those gathered there. Now, they exhibit this want for health and prosperity as well. The three basic passions or three basic motives that drive every human being, passion and pleasure and power. And, and they're out there with Jesus, and he just fed 5,000 with loaves and fish. Just two fish and five loaves, and 5,000 are fed. And they are enamored with the miracle of Jesus. Now, they don't care much for the man, Jesus, but they are smitten with the miracles of Jesus. He has provided for their need. In chapter 6 and verse 28, the Bible says, what can we do to perform the works of God? How can we have this power? There are some who will read Exodus 16 and 17 and say, I want to call bread down from heaven. I want to strike the rock and have water provided. I want to pull up at the ATM and have an endless bank account. That appeals to the human psyche. But Jesus replied in verse 29, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. You want to know what the greatest miracle God has ever done really is? It happens here with regularity. A, a man, a woman, a boy, a girl, hears the gospel. They're dead in their sins and trespasses. They think they're alive. You think they're alive. They walk in on two feet. But the Bible says they are dead in their sins and trespasses. And God says from heaven, through the proclamation of the gospel, little boy, little girl, man, woman, arise, come forth. And the once dead are raised to walk in the newness of life through the power of Jesus Christ. 
Jesus says to the multitude, you want to know what the work of God is? It is to believe on the one whom he has sent. In verse 30, they say, no, you don't understand. Our concerns are not spiritual. They're more pressing than that. That's what they think anyway. In verse 30, they say, what sign then are you going to do so that we may see and believe you? And they ask, what are you going to perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness just as it's written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. It's time to eat again, by the way. That's what brings this conversation around. The thing about bread is it doesn't last long in the belly. What sign will you do now, Jesus? How will you provide for the need that we now have? And Jesus says in verse 32, I assure you, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the real bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They say, sir, give us this bread always. They still don't get it. Give us faith financially and give us physically scratch our worldly itch and jesus said i am the bread of life and no one who comes to me will ever be hungry and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again so the, the problem with humanity is that we really are convinced that our most pressing needs are physical the, the misconception of the health and wealth gospel is that our most pressing needs are physical or financial. Brothers and sisters, our most pressing need is spiritual. The presence of sin in your life dictates that what awaits you is a hellish eternity separated from God. That even in the here and now, your separation from God by virtue of your sin is bearing fruit in your life that is building up the judgment of God against you. Your most pressing need is not the diagnosis. Your most pressing need are not your bills bearing down on you. Your most pressing need are not the challenges you're up against in the workplace. Your most pressing need is a great gulf fixed between you and a holy, holy, holy God. Jesus said, the bread in the wilderness, the manna left them hungry in the end. The 5,000 fed with those loaves and fish were hungry again just hours later. Earthly things cannot satisfy you. But Jesus says, I am, the bread and, and I am the bread of life. Come, taste and see that indeed I am good. He who believes in me will never, will never, will never thirst again. And then Paul takes up the same text in 1 Corinthians 10. Turn over there just quickly. 1 Corinthians 10, beginning in verse number 1. Now there's a long list of examples from Israel's history that are drawn together, but I want to focus just on the rock from which we drink. Jesus took up manna in John 6. Here Paul takes up the water provided in Exodus 17. Verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 10 says, Now I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from a spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Praise him. Praise him. Now, Bible scholars struggle with this one-to-one, -one. that rock was Christ. It seems there's some kind of allegorical treatment of Exodus 17 that's happening, but that's not the case at all. Paul is building on Jesus' interpretation of Exodus 16 and 17, and what he's saying to them is this, you may drink water from a rock. But until you have drank deeply from the rock who is our Jesus, you will never know your thirst alleviated. He's saying what Jesus says concerning the bread in John 6. He's saying, drink from the fountain of the water of life freely and you will never, never, never thirst again. 
He warns them in 1 Corinthians 10 that there were some in the nation of Israel, some who were in the wilderness wandering party, who came out through the Red Sea crossing. They ate the manna from heaven. They drank the water from the rock. But in the end, God was not pleased with them. For they were void of faith. They were interested in the benefits of being a part of God's new nation, Israel. They wanted bread and they wanted water. And hey, don't we all. But, but he warns them that there's, there's more to following Jesus than just being the recipient of the blessings that come along with that relationship. That the call is, is high. The price is, is high. There's a, a, a deep degree of commitment that's called for on the part of those who follow, follow after him. We can get into parsing what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 until we rob it of its meaning. If I could contextualize what I believe Paul to be saying there, it would be this. You can go to church. You can be baptized. You can read your Bible. You can spend time and wrote prayers. You can do all of the things that Christian folk and the Christian culture do today and be lost and perish in hell apart from faith in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul says. What you need is not water from the rock in the wilderness. What you need is a drink from the fountain of life that flows freely from the wounds of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Your, your most pressing need now, this is the early service, so the hunger pains usually don't set in until an hour or so later. Although the fall back may have some effect on that this morning. Your most pressing need is not the grumbling and the groaning in your belly. The parched lips in need of a drink. Your most pressing need is a spiritual one that can only be resolved through the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Amen. I, I, find, I find that even, even in counseling now, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to get people past the immediate need to the deeper spiritual need. I, I, I think I'm, I just say the same thing in counseling. You need Jesus. That's all I have. I'm just, I'm the Baptist preacher, but not the therapist, you know. That's all I got. All I got is Jesus. And let's look at this passage. You need Jesus. That's pretty much how counseling goes with Brother Wade. If you want a little insight into what that looks like one day, you all need Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. Amen. Your marriage needs Jesus. Your children need Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. That's all I got. But it's hard for us to be able to see beyond what's this close to us. We're so blinded by our sin. When the Bible talks about being apart from Christ as walking in darkness, the metaphor works, brothers, because we really are walking in darkness. There's a veil over our eyes. We cannot see plainly what is so clearly before us. We are a sinful and a broken people. And apart from alleviating that condition, you'll never do anything to satisfy your hunger or your thirst. You'll always be craving, running after one thing, then the next thing, then the next thing, then the next thing. And it will never, ever, 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 ever be enough. There, there are goals, there's ambitions that you have set in your mind and you have convinced yourself, if I can ever get to that place, if I could ever eat that bread from heaven, if I could ever drink from that particular rock, everything would be well for me. And I'm telling you, when you get there, it just leaves you empty and jaded and broken and wanting for something you had hoped to find at the last stop. Our most pressing need is for Jesus. I'm just telling you. I don't know what you're chasing after. My boys and I were watching the World Series last week. And, and there, were, there were two players for the Nationals who were veteran players, the oldest team in Major League Baseball. And, and they embraced after the game was over. We didn't really have a rooting interest. We'd pull for this one or that one, whoever was down at the time or whoever we thought was the underdog. And they embraced... And they said, we finally got one. And my thought was not so much good for them, although I was glad for them. There's a level of satisfaction that comes with that, I understand. My thought was more, 
I wonder what they'll do tomorrow. How, how, how will this thing they've been chasing for years now achieved? Leave them tomorrow. And I'm just, I'm just telling you that our, our spiritual, our eternal hunger, the, the thirst that cannot be quenched by the things that neither Egypt nor this world could afford can be satisfied forever in Jesus Christ. You must come to Jesus. Look to him for eternal life. Trust Christ with your soul. Jesus said it plainly in Matthew 6, It said, seek, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you.